All right. Go ahead. Switch with a friend, neighbor. We're going to get some grading on our pop quiz here. Number one, who anointed Jesus at Bethany? Mary. Mary. Yes. No. Half a point. But you need a hundred to get the candy cane, so. Number two, why was Judas not happy about it? All right, here's, here, here's what I'm looking for. Here's what I'm looking for. It was expensive, and he was the keeper of the money bag. If you have just he is the keeper of the money bag, that's fine. If it is just it was expensive, that is not fine. Yes. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> Number three. What did the voice from heaven say? I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. Talking about the name of God. And number four. Why would people believe in Jesus but not acknowledge their faith? What I'm looking for is they enjoyed the praise of man rather than the acknowledge from God. I will take, I will take that they were afraid to be put out of the synagogue as well. No, because that would be for the people that did not believe in Jesus. This is specifically for the people that believed but would not acknowledge it. Man, I, I just can't help you. I just can't help you with that. that decisions were made. All right, who got 100%? Hey, three's pretty good. Three's pretty good. Did you miss it by half? She only missed it by half a point. No. <laughs> Merry Christmas, Blake. Yeah. Merry Christmas. Goodness gracious. You guys are all little lawyers in here. All right, hey. Here's what I'm looking for on our group read of the next chapter. Would you just read with the people that are at your table? And would you please share with one another one thing that is highlighted as you read this together, okay? Let me say a word of prayer, and then we're going to jump into the chapter. Let me say a word of prayer. Lord, as we dive into your word, Lord, um, man, it's just pure truth that we get to study and that we get to just pour ourselves over, Lord. We, uh, we acknowledge scripture as being authority. We acknowledge it being written through your Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit who lives inside of us, Lord. Would you show us your truth and something about our lives, Lord, that can be applicable to this chapter today. We invite you here to this room and to this time. You know, we pray. Amen. 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 Yes. All right, yeah, let's bring it back together. Come on over. Bring it back together. All right, who heard something or shared something that you would like to share with the larger group? All of us together. Yeah.
Yeah. Yeah, we've got plenty of room to grow in our love for one another. And especially when it says um, loving one another as disciples. Um, is the church good at loving people in the church? It's setting the example. Could be better. Could be better. Other things that stuck out. Yeah, Kate. That's great. Yeah, Abigail. Yes. I noticed something along that line, but earlier I noticed that um, Peter, he basically said, Peter, you're clean, that's why I only need to wash your feet. But there's someone else here that's not clean. Mm -hmm. And at that point, Judas hadn't actually done it, like any of the things yet, that mm -hmm. maybe talked to the uh, mm -hmm. up and ups. And um, <coughs> so, like, it's interesting because, like, before, everything was what you did. What you did made you more clean, but here, Jesus. That's, that's really astute, the um, process that you're seeing there. I think that's really interesting. Yeah. Right there, I think I think there is a a larger lesson in that. People bring expectations to God and what they expect from God, and the disciples definitely had expectations on Jesus from their understanding of what the Messiah was going to do, right? And um, I think a lot of times people get really hurt when God doesn't meet their expectations. And I think it's one of the greatest things that people walk away from Christianity from is because they don't feel that God is following through on their perception of what God should be doing, right? And I think um, the disciples right, having expectations, not having them met, just having all these things going over their heads, I think it happens to us with God as well when we, when we begin to categorize him or put him in a box or decide that this is what God has to do. We, ter we need to remember that God is God, and he does his thing, and we follow along, and the way that he chooses to act, that's, that's who we worship is that God. Now, we know a lot about God through the revelation that he's given us in scripture. We don't expect God to go and do something contrary to scripture, nor should we. But that being said, God is, God's ways are higher than our ways, and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And if we don't worship a mysterious God, then we're not worshiping God, because he is always going to be greater than us and more than us. Anyways, that was my mini sermon. Anyone else <coughs> from John chapter 13? Yeah. I mentioned that like verse 16. Um, um, you said the, about the messenger and like the one who sent him. It's like God and like Jesus sending him. We're not greater than him at all. Like we can like hmm. ask him for stuff. So we're not. <coughs> 
Hmm. It's good. It's key. It's really key. Okay. Are you talking about verses 16 in particular? Sure. So it says, very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. What he's talking about here is humility, right? Which he just showed in a very real way by washing their feet. And he's saying that, that we need to be humble and on the same field, that a servant is not greater than the master and that the messenger is not greater than the one who sent him. And the ultimate humility comes between us and God. Servants who are not greater than the master and messengers not greater than the one who sent also, we see humility working within the Trinity of Jesus saying, I don't do my will, but I do the will of my Father. And he's setting an example for us to be humble, not only with God, but with one another by taking on the example of Jesus's humility. Does that help? Great. Yes. Um, so verse 10, Stevie brought this up, um, doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Um, <laughs> the one who is made doesn't need to wash anything except his feet, but he is completely clean. Um, and I, just, I don't really get what the exception of the feet is. Like, <laughs> um, so, you know, God talks about seeing the hands of Jesus tied to anybody. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Well, you have to put it in context, right? Jesus is washing feet. And he says, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part of me. So maybe what we can put in exchange there is to have a part in Jesus, you have to have your feet washed. This is the analogy that we're working in right now. What he's saying here is that, Peter, you need your feet to be washed Okay, what's Jesus about to do? Go die on the cross, be resurrected, save the world from sin, right? You need to have me do that for you, but you don't need to be drenched like someone else needs to be drenched. So as opposed to getting caught up in the whole body versus feet only, really the point that Jesus is making here is you need my service in your life, but there's someone else that needs <coughs> even more drastic <laughs> of a thing than what you need because of where your heart is. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Could you think of like our feet when we stand as our foundation? Sure. I think. More so, it's the act of service, that a servant would wash feet, and thus he is serving by his humility. So, okay, well, let's get into the lecture a little bit, and as more questions come up, we will jump into them as we see them. I love the opening of this chapter. He says he knew the hour had come because it was just before the Passover. And I love that it says this. He said, um, it had, the hour had come for him to leave the world and go to the Father. And having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them until the end. It's this love that he has for the disciples and for those that God had given into the hand of the Son. And it's this love that he's going to hang on to, and he's going to act out of love for those people until the end. 
I, I think it's a nice poetic way of saying that Jesus was very intentional about going into his death and that the intention was love that he had for all those people. Now it says in verse 2 that the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot to betray Jesus. And it's kind of an interesting thing that happens here. You know, we, we don't often see the devil mentioned as indwelling as we saw off after the bread. We don't often see the devil as showing up in a, a specific temptation with a follower. And I think it speaks to the epicness that's happening here near the death of Jesus. All the spiritual forces are at play right now. The devil is on the realm. He's very focused on what's happening in Jerusalem at this time. And he's very, very focused in trying to bring about the destruction of Jesus. Now, of course, the great irony is that the devil in all of his efforts just sacrifices the lamb who has come to take away the sin of the world. But the intention here of evil and the most evil possible is worthy to know in the betrayal of Jesus. I believe that this betrayal really hurt Jesus. In fact, it says later in the chapter that, you know, he was, he was really, it says, somber in spirit or disturbed in spirit. Um this type of groaning of spirit that he was having by the, by the fact that Judas would travel with him for three years like that, be close by, and that would be willing to give up Jesus and betray him in that way. I believe it really hurt. Now Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, that he came from God and was returning to God. <laughs> okay? This puts the humility of washing the feet into a grand perspective. The idea that Jesus knew the Father very, very well, that he had been given all the power, and that he was going back to the Father. In the midst of that, that's when Jesus takes off his outer cloak and serves. Right? Do you guys see that? Jesus understood his authority. And he understood where he was going. And it was out of that spark that he decides to wash the feet. It reminds me a lot of Philippians chapter 2, um, where it says, Though Jesus was in very nature God, did not consider that godly nature something to be grasped, but instead made himself nothing, taking on the very form of a servant being made in human likeness, right? This is what we see is this servant full Jesus who's washing the feet. Now the washing of the feet, is this the next one? Yeah. The washing of the feet probably symbolizes the service of Jesus that everyone needs. It's this willing to be humble, this willing to die for others. And this idea of unless I wash you, you have no part in me. And it has to do with forgiveness. It has to do with getting clean. It has to do with your sin being dealt with and paid for. And then he goes on to say, do you understand what I have done for you? And he says, as I, your teacher and Lord, has washed your feet, so I want you to wash one another. And then we talked about verse 16 quite a bit already. What a beautiful picture, right? Jesus, who literally the next day is about to be beaten and crucified, is taking these final moments, and he's leaving the people with a very concrete picture, the disciples with a very, very concrete picture of what he has desired for one another. Now, this is kind of an interesting question. You know, we have sacraments in the church. We have the sacrament of baptism. We have the sacrament of um, communion, holy communion. 
We have the sacrament of marriage. And I don't know if you've ever wondered about this, but there was a question as to why is foot washing not practiced in the Christian churches like washing feet? Why don't we on Sunday morning have a bunch of basins with a bunch of towels and everyone can go around and wash each other's feet every single week? (laughs) Because he says to do this, right? Well, other sacraments, like name they were practiced in the early church we don't have any example in the early church of them doing the sacrament a sacrament is a action that has an inner depth of understanding and, and theological meaning and nowhere else in the new testament is it commanded like baptism is commanded it's mentioned in first timothy 510, but it's not mentioned as something that needs to be repeated and needs to be done. Now, that being said, the imagery of what happens here of serving one another, that does need to be done in the church by the teachers, by the pastors, by everyone. Really, and I'm going to go back to Philippians 2 and quote it, that having the same mind of Jesus by putting other people's needs above your own. So the service needs to happen even if we don't physically do it the same way that we physically do baptisms or first communion. I was thinking the service is still a thing that we would put on because our feet are not very like they were back in Yeah. Um, I, I don't think that has a lot to do with why it's not a sacrament because... Um, but I do think that's probably a reason that it's not practiced widely in the same way is because you're right. We, we have paved roads rather than gravel and we wear socks and shoes and we try not to, well, at least on the mainland, you try not to show your feet to anyone, right? Here, it's a little more chill. Cool. Has anyone ever had their feet washed in a, in a service or something? I have too. It was really weird. I did not enjoy the, uh, I, don't, I don't like feet in general. I don't even like my own feet. Like, I don't like trimming my own nails. Having someone else touching my feet was bizarre. The first time is really weird, but if you have it happen again, it, yeah. I don't know, your perspective changes, at least mine did. I had a really cool experience where I was about your guy's age, um, 20, 20 years old, and uh, at a camp right before we decided, or right before all the students were coming, where I was going to be a camp counselor, the adult staff got down with basins and watched all the, like, young adults' feet. It was very powerful. Still weird, but it was very, very powerful. Betrayal. Jesus had knowledge of it, and he understood that there was a problem to go along with it. The prophecy comes from Psalm 41.9. Even my close friend, someone I trust, one who shared my bread has turned against me. Now Jesus kind of drops a little I am statement here in the middle of this. In verse 19, he says, I am telling you this now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. Same phrase that we heard from the burning bush when Moses asked, who am I going to say has sent me? I am who I am. Then Jesus, knowing this psalm, knowing the betrayal, still gives Judas this piece of bread. I wonder if this is on my next slide or on this one. Okay, I'll let you guys, let you guys get it done. I know you guys don't like to leave some words. Unwritten. (laughs) So this next slide, it's interesting in the midst of the betrayal that it seems like Jesus is still in control. (laughs) Saying to Judas, what you're about to do, do it quickly. And while Jesus was murdered and betrayed with real evil intent, I really believe Jesus was not a victim to these things that he walked into it willingly, that he wasn't one that this was happening to, but he was knowingly understood the injustice, 
gritted his teeth, and took it because it was his mission from God. I think it's important to be like Jesus and not be a victim of surroundings, but instead to see what God has in it, to be strong and confident. And then this was interesting too, in, in the guys I was reading, it says, not just was Jesus washing Judas's feet, because the washing happened pri- prior to this, but Jesus also giving Judas bread. And they see the giving of the bread, even an additional reaching out and blessing and love, where Jesus is giving, he's serving, he's caring for him. And in the midst of all of it, Jesus isn't making drama or blowing the thing up or yelling at him. He's just loving him. Now we have the disciple whom Jesus loved. The first time we see it here is in John 13, and it's not going to be the last time. This is the name for who, who I believe to be the disciple of John and who I believe to be the author of this book. This term for John is going to come up at the cross at the empty tomb by the Sea of Tiberias and in the final couple verses of the book. Um, Why? Why would this be a term? Well, I kind of think it's the author referring to himself in the third person and not making it about him but instead saying, hey, I'm just the guy that Jesus loved. I'm just the guy that's defined by Jesus. I'm not the hero here. I'm not um, one that should be glorified, but rather, I just want to be known by my connection to Christ. Great identity. I think it's a great identity. So John would be most likely the disciple whom Jesus loved. There is. Lots of scholarly papers written about arguments of different people who it should be. And sometimes the simplest thing is, is the one to go for. I think this is our last slide for today. What we're going to begin here is a long block of teaching that Jesus is going to give, and it is really beautiful. John, the end here, John 14 and John 15 are some of my just absolutely favorite chapters in the Bible. Jesus is going to go off saying beautiful things. And uh, this starts it here. And I love that you pulled this, the Son of Man is glorified, God is glorified, and you connected that right to it we talked about in the last chapter. About the voice of heaven saying, when Jesus is like, God, would your name be glorified? He says, I have glorified it. I will glorify it again. Jesus is saying, God is being glorified by Jesus. And it's just beautiful. Then he goes on to say, Where I'm going, you cannot come. And a new command that I give you, you love one another as I have loved you. That needs to be connected to Jesus on the floor with his outer garment off, with the towel on, washing feet. You must love one another. And then this verse 35 is a bit haunting, and it's a good call to every Christian. By this, by this loving of one another, will all, everyone will know that you are my disciples. About this love that you have for one another. Now, I do believe that this is a love for one another within the discipleship community, within the twelfth of loving one another as the church I also believe that Christians should be known for their love of those outside. And that, you know, sometimes it's easier to love non-Christians than it is to love Christians. Sometimes it's easier to love Christians than it is to love the (laughs) non-Christians. But I would challenge you, whatever group you feel might be easier to love and to serve and to care for, start working on the other group and work on whatever you might find a little more of a weakness and be intentional about strengthening that. So, for instance, if you're really good at loving people in the church, you love to go down there early on Sunday, you love to say hello to all the aunties and the uncles that come in, 
You love to see all the little children. You love to greet people in the church. You think that it's really great, but you're kind of scared of strangers. Then you might want to work on intentional love for the stranger. If you're instead, you come into church, you'll be like, man, these people are weird. I just want to go hang out with some non-Christians, which a lot of people can feel more comfortable in those situations. Go and force yourself to introduce yourself to people that are in the church and learn how to love the body of Christ. I really think it's really important that people, that people will know that we are disciples of Jesus because of our love for one another. I think that that's such a beautiful, beautiful thing. I wish that's what the first initial impression when someone says the word church in secular society, I wish that their first thing that popped into their mind was, oh, those are the most loving people I ever met. (laughs) I wish that they thought of unity amongst the church. I wish that they thought about, wow, those are the people that are always doing things for others in love. You know, what, what if the church one day is known more for the things that we believe in doing? What if we're known more for what we do than for what we stand against? I believe that's what Jesus is all about. What are we doing? How are we loving? How are we showing? You know, you can love someone, and if you don't do anything about it, that person will never know that you love them. Such a deep connection between action and service and love. We'll get more into that next time. Any questions here? The end of John chapter 13. Cool. I'm going to pray for you guys and you'll be dismissed. God, I thank you that you set the example through your son, Jesus, of washing our feet, Lord, what a, what a radical thing that you as king and creator, as one being in the very nature, God, would be willing to come to this earth, that you would be willing to serve in such a radical manner, that you'd be willing to serve even more in your death. Lord, we could never give back everything that you've given us. And Lord, we, we say thank you. And what we do is we turn into living sacrifices to give everything that we have to the one who paid it all. Lord, I just want to ask that we um, will practice the foot washing, Lord, in our lives, that we'll care for Christians, that we'll care for non-Christians, that we'll care for people, just for being people. Lord, let us be people that are full of action, that are known by our love. We pray this in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, you guys are dismissed.